I'd like to open this public hearing uh, to discuss the uh, public hearing on the proposed 2014 budget. My name is Judy Myers. I'm chair of Budget and Appropriations. And with me this evening are several legislators. Starting over at my right is Legislator Sheila Marcotte, Legislator Virginia Perez, Legislator Pete Harcum, Legislator Michael Smith, and legis Legislator uh, Mary Jane Shimsky. So we understand that you have all filled out cards. What I will do is um, call up five at a time. And um, if you would just line up here over to the right, and then you have um, three minutes? Three minutes in which to speak, and we'll all be taking very, very rapid notes <laughs> as you speak. So could we have Lisa Buck and Jean Blum, Roberta Goodman, Dennis Hanratty, Hanratty Tim Fallon, and Eva Dolgen, please. First up, Lisa Buck and Jean Blanc. Hi, everyone. Thanks for this opportunity to share some thoughts with you this evening. Again, I'm Lisa Buck, and I'm director of the Bridge Fund, and I'm here with Jeannie Bloom, executive director of the Coalition for the Hungry and Homeless, and we're here as co-chairs of the Westchester Eviction Prevention Network. Um, we want to talk about homelessness, and uh, as it continues to rise, the um, homeless shelters are operating at capacity and the county's working hard to not house homeless people in motels once again, reminiscent of the late 80s and early 90s. There are close to 700 children in homeless shelters and emergency housing units at this time. And we're here to ask that the $200,000 for eviction prevention funding be added into the 2014 budget. And this would be for direct service for eviction prevention not a penny of it would go to administrative costs. Um, and it would help keep hundreds of families in their homes um, in the next year. And as you know, homelessness prevention works, and it has for decades. And in fact, homelessness began to rise in 2012 when the federal recovery funding was um, put to an end. Uh, and that was the Homelessness Prevention Rapid Rehousing. And as soon as that stopped, that funding stopped, homelessness started to rise again here in Westchester. Um, so that's all I have to say. And we would also, thank you, Lisa. And we would also like to say that we are here in support of the Westchester Women's Agenda budget requests to urge you to reinstate funding for children's services, health care, and housing, with a special exclamation point on the adding the 200,000 for homelessness prevention services, which the Westchester Women's Agenda supports. Thank you so much. Thank you. Could we have R Roberta Goodman, please? Good evening. Thank you. Um, I am Roberta Goodman. I am one of the staff attorneys at the Elder Justice Unit of the Pace Women's Justice Center. And we are proud members of the Westchester Women's Agenda. Our program is focused exclusively on providing free civil legal services for Westchester County victims. Many of our clients have multiple legal problems and we are their only access to redress. Since our inception in 2005, we have represented over 1,000 victims of elder abuse, and we are grateful for your past support and continued support that we are hopeful for. Thank you very much. Thank you. Dennis Hanratty. 
Madam Chair, members of the board, uh, thank you for entertaining us tonight. My name is Dennis Hanrady. I'm the executive director of Mount Vernon United Tenants, the only funded and staffed tenant association in Westchester. I'm going to follow up a little bit on both Ms. Bucks and Ms. Blum's uh, presentation regarding homelessness prevention because Mount Vernon United Tenants, I think, is well known for that. Uh, I have some stats here from the – I've got 18 there, one for everybody and one for you too, Sally, okay? Uh, about the numbers, how the numbers have increased. Uh, from July of last year to July of this year, there's been a 24% increase in the, uh, people in homeless shelters. And if you take it from January, July of 2011, it's a 52% increase. That's being borne by the taxpayers. Uh, we think, you know, as the two ladies mentioned pri previously, an ounce of prevention is worth a real pound of cure in this, uh, keeping people out of the homeless system. And there's a lot of good people in this homeless uh, prevention network that work really hard over time, 24, day, 24 hours, seven days a week, trying to keep people out. I'm going to pass out also a recent mailing that we did that talked about our eviction prevention work from our contract, not our contract here, but from our annual meeting from October of uh, 2012 to October 2013. We stopped 147 evictions and we helped rehouse 15 individuals or families. So just think about that. Now, maybe not every one of those would have ended up in the shelter system, but you've got to think maybe 10 percent or something like that. To be cost effective, we only have to stop about one. Uh, so we're really saving the county huge, huge amounts of money. In addition to that, on the back, on the second page is the, uh, the data of the homelessness prevention by month, and on the reverse side of that is the list of the buildings. We've also helped organize, provide organizing or technical administrative assistance to 18 separate buildings. The great majority in Mount Vernon, but there's a few there in Yonkers, uh, one or two in New Rochelle. As the only funded and staff tenant association, even though we're a Mount Vernon-based organization, we get calls from all over the county for individual assistance and for building organizing assistance. So you have some data there about some of the stuff that we do. We've been a long time partner with the Department of Social Services. That was ended a few years ago. The county board put us back in a couple of years ago. We hope they're going to do it again. Uh, we think the bang for the buck for our agency is tremendous for the county, both for the taxpayers, but most especially for those people who are spared the, the incredible, incredible pain and suffering of homelessness. I have to deal with clients day in, day out, come, you know, crying, screaming. Uh, the threat of losing somebody's home is such a disastrous thing, especially this time of year. I was in court yesterday with three different clients from one building with terrible, terrible conditions. We went to trial. We won all three of those cases. They're all going to get a significant abatement. So we do this stuff on a regular basis with a very, very small budget. I think, like I say, we're a tremendous bang for the buck for the county. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Tim Fallon. Hi, I'm Tim Fallon, Senior Immigration Counsel at My Sister's Place. As you may know, we're a Westchester-wide organization. We also serve clients outside of the county from time to time, depending on our funding. Uh, I would like to thank the board for supporting the work of MSP, My Sister's Place, year after year. We really appreciate it. Um, I'm, I'm here to ask, obviously, specifically that your, the board would restore uh, the funding for our human trafficking work, of which I am a part of the legal representation of victims and survivors of human trafficking. Uh, my colleague and I, um, the, the money funds part of our salaries, and obviously I'm not here on a, on a personal mission, but I'm really here to make you un or to encourage the understanding of the kind of work that we do with that funding. Uh, we provide immigration relief to victims of human trafficking, and that can come in many forms. Uh, we work closely with uh, federal and state law enforcement on cases with uh, helping victims become more comfortable and, and sort of like normalize their lives so that they can help testify in prosecutions against the traffickers. Uh, we're also starting a project where we're assisting clients who um, receive convictions, serious felony convictions as a result of being victims of trafficking and we're helping to work with them to vacate these convictions. Uh, as, as is obvious, and I think you would know from the news and from our work, uh, human trafficking, the, the case numbers are just the occurrence has greatly increased in Westchester County and across the nation. It's really spilled over from New York City, obviously. Um, I myself right now am representing 18 victims of human trafficking in different legal aspects, whether it be immigration or the vacating that I was talking about. Uh, my colleague, um, who this, the funding also supports, he represents 10 clients. Um, we've, we've screened dozens of clients in the last year just uh, through our regular consultation process, which is an immigration legal and a family legal consultation process. 
Uh, we're, we're doing training and outreach. I've spoken at conferences around the country on different forms of immigration legal relief for victims of trafficking. And I'd like to thank you for your support again, and I appreciate you having me speak. Thanks. Thank you very much. <laughs> Eva Dolgen, and while Eva is coming up, could we have Joanne Mongelli, Jonathan Potter, Sally Pinto, Kathy Hallis, and Tyla Tilla Younger, please. Eva. Hi, good evening. My name is Eva Dolgen, and I am from my sister's place. I'm our director of community education and prevention programs. And first, thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk about something that I am incredibly passionate about, and that's the work of prevention. And the fact that the, B the Board of Legislators has supported not only all of my sister's place work for so long, but the work of prevention is incredibly essential to us as my sister's place and we believe to Westchester County in general. Um, and so what does that do? Last year, with your $20,000, you are helping to support our domestic violence education and prevention program. And just to give you a sense of what my incredible four-person staff did last year, just in 2012, they served over 5,000 youth. That's four people. <laughs> four people doing an arrangement of healthy relationships presentations, eight week long sessions in middle schools, and really specifically, three intensive conferences. One that we coordinated kind of with agencies across the, across the county called Pride Works for LGBTQ and allied youth that I know you all are super supportive of. Um, one called Summer Institute, which is our week long kind of activist training camp where we really take youth from across the county, bring them into our offices for a week, and talk about what is domestic violence and how can you impact your community. And Love Shouldn't Hurt, which is one of our kind of best known initiatives. It's a one day conference. We work with about 320 to 350 high school students and their teachers. And we talk about teen dating violence and how they can bring this word out um, and spread information about what it means to be supportive and what it means to, sh to have relationships built on respect. And so what are we talking about? We're talking about um, a handful of people reaching thousands of kids. And we're talking about kids who give us feedback like presentations from my sister's place lets me know that I can have relationships that don't have abuse. It lets me know that I can be res a respectful partner that I can be equal to someone, that I can make choices in my relationship, and that I deserve that, and that my sister's place is around if people need help. And that's what the work of prevention is, and that's why we care so much, because realistically, as Tim, my colleague, was just talking about, we can talk about the thousands of survivors that we're serving. I wanna talk about the thousands of kids we're hoping don't need our services later, but rather are ambassadors Ambassadors for people who are using power and, and control against a dating partner and saying, hey, that's not okay. And ambassadors, ambassadors to those who are experiencing it, saying you have a place to go. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> Joanne Mongelli. Good evening, I'm Joanne Mongelli, Deputy Director of Arts Westchester. I want to thank you for your ongoing support for the arts and for recognizing how the arts enhance community, individual, and economic well-being in the county. Um, I should also say as an aside that we partner with many human service agencies and we uh, recognize the importance of the agen women's agenda items. Well, we believe it is appropriate and important for the government to support the arts. We understand that it's not government's role alone. And that's why um, the funds that we distribute to agencies all across the county really represent a minute, minute part of any cultural organization's budget. It's also why we're asking for a add of $250,000 to institute a challenge for the arts. This challenge for the arts provides incentive money for individuals to give to cultural organizations. 
And over the last six years when the challenge was in place, we raised over $1.4 million, uh, almost doubling the county's investment. I'm going to ask some of my colleagues in the cultural community to give you some specifics of how important the challenge for the arts is. It will be only three minutes, I promise. Youth Theater Interaction serves more than 300 Yonkers children and teens annually. But it is a struggle to ensure consistent programming because much of our funding does come from reimbursable grants. The challenge for the arts enabled us to continue offering classes during a very difficult financial period for our organization. And equally important, it enabled us to cultivate new uh, donor bases that we had not tapped into previously. Thank you. The Steffi Nossen Dance Foundation has been supporting arts in Westchester for over 77 years. Our motto is everyone can dance and everyone should. The Steffi Nossen Dance Foundation is committed to making dance available to all individuals. The Challenge for the Arts supported our Moving Wheels and Heels program, which is specifically designed for physically and mentally challenged individuals. Uh, I think the Challenge for the Arts is a perfect example of the community and county working together, and I would appreciate your support. The Challenge for the Arts enabled the Yonkers Philharmonic to provide a free symphonic concert at SUNY Purchase. We filled 1,300 seats, mostly families who told us they could not afford to bring their children to a concert hall. This is a wonderful experience that we provide free, and the Challenge for the Arts helped us to provide it at SUNY Purchase instead of at Saunders Auditorium. The Blue Door Artists Association is a small grassroots arts organization that installs public art throughout Yonkers and operates a gallery in the heart of downtown Yonkers. The gallery uh, provides education. The Times had an article just a few days ago that in Arkansas, they found a 20% increase in the school productivity and intelligence of the children who were bused to the local museum that uh, Walmart's daughter endowed. And uh, we've taken children from Yonkers down to the Met. We have contacts there. And uh, we're, we're uh, bringing more joy into people's lives and we uh, need the unrestricted funds so we can grow our organization, that we can actually bring it to the attention of the rest of the county. We are available to uh, <clears throat> bring public art to communities. We now have the skill. We've just decorated the promenade uh, next to the Hudson River with uh, sculpture, beautiful exhibit. And uh, we, we want to be able to do that for the rest of the county and the growth fund is how to do it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Jonathan Potter. Good evening. My name is Jonathan Potter, and I'm here to present testimony on behalf of Student Advocacy, an educational advocacy organization that gets kids on track to school success. I know firsthand about student advocacy because I've served as a volunteer and I've attended the agency's annual Overcoming the Odds Awards Dinner. I've learned why other young people need student advocacy's help. Currently, I'm in the 12th grade at Scarsdale High School, and I feel that my perspective can be helpful as you ask the question, why is it so important for the county to continue to support services for kids? Without quality programs, whether it is specific communities or countywide, kids would be at much greater risk of dropping out of school, using drugs, joining gangs, and getting into serious trouble. Kids in communities would suffer while the county would pick up the cost of their failure. Quality youth programs create opportunities for young people by teaching positive values and improving academic, social, moral, and emotional competencies. Good programs create leaders who can be strong advocates for themselves and their communities. We thank the county for maintaining the 2013 level of funding for investing kids in 2014, but ask that the total allocation be restored to the 2012 level of 2.1 million. IIK gives the county the opportunity to support the most needed and effective youth programs. 
For the next IIK funding cycle that begins in 2015, the needs assessment process should be data-driven, transparent and inclusive, and consideration should be given to a 10% increase in the total IIK allocation. Student advocacy is also very concerned about early childhood issues. Thank you for continuing to fund Early Step Forward within the Department of Community Mental Health budget. This service is crucial in the development of young children with mental health challenges. Identifying these challenges early on can help increase school readiness and improve social and emotional engagement, creating a more positive and supportive environment for the child, family, and school. We also believe that the county would benefit greatly if you addressed affordable child care by making the parent contribu contribution for child care subsidies no more than 20% of a family's over poverty income and opening up financial assistance for families over 200% of the federal poverty level. We also urge the county to continue and expand youth employment efforts by extending more employment opportunities and job readiness skills training to high school and even middle school students. Finally, as a member of nonprofit Westchester, student advocacy urges you to consider a 3 cost percent cost of living increase to contracts with all nonprofits. Let's continue to support Westchester County youth through effective programs and services that give our young people the tools they need to succeed. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Sally Pinto. Hello, my name is Sally Pinto and I'm a resident of Yonkers. I'm also a program coordinator for JCY Westchester Community Partners, a nonprofit that brings older adult volunteers into our public schools, hospitals, and libraries to tutor, mentor, and mentor struggling students through our smart Reading Buddies After School, Introduction to America, Open Book, and Summer Reading Buddies programs. I would like to thank the Board of Legislator, Legislators for giving us this opportunity to comment on the budget. I hope you all have heard that Westchester County has been given the honor from Generations United and MetLife of being the best intergenerational community in the United States for 2013. So congratulations. Many of our legislators have come to the New York State Intergenerational Network known as NYSEIN, which we have spearheaded since its inception seven years ago in advocating on the economic and social value of intergenerational planning. The Westchester chapter thanks you for your support. JCY Westchester Community Partners has just merged with Family Services Society of Yonkers, FISI. This merger provides the opportunity for us to serve even more students and adults. Every year, my agency educates, supports, mentors, and changes the educational experience of 7,000 students and 600 volunteers in 41 sites throughout Westchester County. Besides these impressive figures, we also have the quantitative and qualitative data to support our claim that we positively impact the education of our students. We need to educate our children, we need to engage our older adults, we need to bring the generations together. As I am the coordinator for the ESL Center at Yonkers High School, and now the new ESL Center at Lincoln High School, I can tell you firsthand how important these programs are in giving students who are just arrived to the United States the assistance they need to succeed academically in this country. We also receive two Invest in Kids contracts. The programs that Invest in Kids provide offer positive in and out of school time opportunities for young people, increase school success, reduce juvenile crime, improve long-term economic productivity, thus reducing societal costs. Incarcerating one teen teenager costs about $240,000 per year. Prevention costs just a tiny fraction of this amount and helps youth and communities thrive. Keep our older adults living in Westchester County and provide opportunities for them to engage in our communities. Westchester County has the largest immigration of 60 plus populations in the state. And we know that older adults who volunteer and are active stay healthier, thereby keeping our health care costs down. Intergenerational programs make economic sense. Educating our children makes sense. How do you want your taxpayer dollars invested? $1,500 per student per year for services such as tutoring, mentoring, job readiness, and leadership to help a teen stay in school and reach his or her potential versus tens of thousands in lost economic productivity. Thank you again for your time and consideration. Thank you. <laughs> Kathy Hallis.
Thank you so much for the chance to speak with you. Uh, my name is Kathy Hallis. I'm Executive Director of the Child Care Council. Just about everyone is working now, or trying to. 70% of mothers are in the U.S. workforce, and 55% of mothers with babies are working. 75% of employed mothers are working 30 or more hours per week. And in 29% of two-parent working families, the mother is the primary wage earner. At the Child Care Council, we talk with thousands of parents every year. In the last five years, we've assisted almost 19,000 parents in their efforts to find child care. In 2012, the over 3,500 parents we spoke with were working at over 1,700 employers, including Montefiore, PepsiCo, Westchester County, Columbia, IBM, J.P. Morgan Chase. So we know very well the struggles of families to afford the safe, quality child care they want for their children. But we wanted to know more, so this summer we did a survey. We heard from over 700 families, and here's what they told us. What they pay for child care generally increases along with their income. The largest single cluster of parents was paying between $1 and $200 a week, but many were paying $500 and as much as $700 and even $900. 57% had trouble paying for care in the last six months at all income levels to pay for care. 60% had reduced other household expenses. 54% had borrowed money and or used credit. 34% modified their child care arrangements and 12% reduced their work hours. Of those currently receiving the subsidy, 48% were having trouble paying their parent's share and 26% were, beh were behind. 69% had borrowed money and or used credit cards to pay for care. The single group having the most difficulty affording child care were those folks around Title 20. We appreciate very much that the parent share is not 35%. 27% is better, but it's too high, and we need more Title 20 subsidy slots. Just to give you an example, a family of three with one child earning $40,000 cannot get a child care subsidy because the cutoff for their family is $39,060. The average cost of infant care in this county is over $16,000, which represents 40% of that family's gross income. So what happens? Well, one parent may reduce their work hours or stay home, thereby reducing their earnings, or they may put their child in non-licensed child care, where chances are this child will receive little or no education, putting this child's educational future at risk. This is not an exaggeration, as the evidence is overwhelming that the achievement gap starts right away, and it does not go away without tremendous expense, and even then, not at all for many of our children. According to Ready Nation, a coalition of business leaders, children who don't get a good start can be 18 months behind a kindergarten, by age three, children from low-income homes know half as many words. Uh, those not reading proficiently by grade three are four times more likely to drop out of high school. The initial failure to launch triggers a succession of further issues, which continue to compound and end up being so much more costly than the original outlay for quality child care. We must put all of our children in the best possible position to succeed Otherwise, we will surely never run out of customers for our public benefit programs. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Tyler Younger, and while she's coming up, could we have Carolyn Fluckinger, Felice Harris, Jalen Montgomery, Joanna Straub, and Denita Blount. I'd also like to say at this time that we've been joined by two other legislators, we have Legislator Lyndon Williams to the far left, and our Chairman of the Board of Legislators, Ken Jenkins. Tyler. Good evening. Hi, my name is Tila Younger. Tila. I have no fancy title. I'm simply a parent of this child who attends the Safe Haven After School Program. I'm here tonight to tell anyone that will listen about the importance of investing kids county program. We need this program to stay. All of us have seen the commercials about children in foreign countries that are hungry and alone. But who thinks about all the elementary school children that get out of school at 3 o'clock and go home and they're hungry and they're alone? 
If we don't keep our after school programs in play, this will continue to happen. I believe that we need to invest in, in kids is very important to restore the total allocation for the investment in kids at a 2012 level of approximately 2.1 million to reconstitute the total allocation, including the line item invest in kids in the miscellaneous budget into a single budget line to be administered by the youth borough through a competitive RFP and plan to increase the total allocation by 10%, 210 million in the 2015 fiscal year and develop a data-driven, transparent and inclusive needs assessment process for allocation of all youth borough funds. The reason this is important is because there are programs like Safe Haven. It's an after school program and a summer program. I can't afford camp, but Safe Haven makes it affordable. I can't afford an after school babysitter, but Safe Haven is free. We really need this program because it not only serves my child, but many children in Westchester County. And then they also have the step up program. That's for males that are from 14 to 21 years old. These are children that are delinquents, children that have gang relations, and they put them in a positive way, you know, through educational needs. And then they have the youth empowerment program, and that's a job readiness program. It serves so many children. In my neighborhood alone, we know, we know that the importance of having children redirected in a positive way at a young age is very important. I don't want my little girl to be alone. I don't get off till 4.30. She doesn't get out till 5. I personally, as so many other parents, maybe not here tonight, but they need, they're in need, whether they know it or not, they're in need of the Safe Haven after school program, the summer camp that Safe Haven provides, because us working mothers financially just can't make it. There was a time when I was on DSS, and I'm employed today. And I'm trying, you know, really hard, thank you. I'm really, really trying to make a nine to five and pay my bills. And all I want is my kid to be safe till I get there. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Carolyn Fluckinger. Thank you for the opportunity to be heard at this public hearing on the 2014 budget. My name is Carolyn Flickinger. I'm a resident of Yonkers. I'm a, the director of both the Kinship Support Program and the Southwest Yonkers Community for All Ages at the Family Service Society of Yonkers. I'm also the co-chair of the Westchester Grandparents Coalition. The Kinship Support Program serves caregivers and the children they are raising throughout the county and is the most Com comprehensive program of its kind in Westchester. The Community for All Ages is a partnership between local agencies and residents to improve the health of residents of Southwest Yonkers. We are part of the Westchester County, the Westchester chapter of the New York State Intergenerational Network, known as NYSIGN, where I also serve on the board. Westchester County is a good place to grow old, grow up and grow old together. Westchester stands out as a model for how to successfully spread across the community a wide range of intergenerational programs that enhance the collaborations across sectors, build leadership of civic engagement of all ages, increase social cohesion among the generations, and address a broad range of critical concerns from a lifespan perspective. Westchester has more than 40 intergenerational programs. They're on shared sites, individual on-site, and the two community for all ages initiatives based on the model developed by the Intergenerational Center at Temple University. Several have been recognized as national models. Nice Sign Westchester, a local educational advocacy group of individuals and organization meets bi-monthly to share, strategize, and keep Westchester on track as an outstanding intergenerational community. While you have heard just a little bit ago from my uh, colleague Sally Pinto, Westchester County has been selected as one of the top five intergenerational 
communities in the United States for 2013 by Generations United and the MetLife Foundation, a most prestigious national award. But at the same time, it faces the loss of our major funder and our strategic partner for the past 12 years, the Helen Andrus Benedict Foundation. At this time, they have told us they are changing their focus as of 2014, which affects many of the intergenerational programs in Westchester. U.S. County legislators have a role to play. You can allocate funds to support the intergenerational programs in the county. You can put together a task force to look into the economic, social, and community benefits of intergenerational programming, especially with the focus of not losing the award winning IG programs in our county when the Helen Andrus Benedict Foundation changes their focus. And you can support the inclusion of an intergenerational component in all county practices, contracting, and programming to benefit people of all ages and to use the skills of all residents in the, in the county. I encourage you to meet with us and learn about these issues. And you are invited to our next NYSIGN Westchester meeting on December 4th at the Fordham University Westchester campus located at 400 Westchester Avenue in West Harrison at 9 o'clock. Thank you very much. Thank you. Felice Harris. Hi, my name is Felice Harris and I'm the director of Lands and Learning Center here in Yonkers. And I'm obviously here in support of child care. As a director, I see the struggles of our parents every single day. And we just have a very short message, and that is we'd like to see the parent share lowered, and we'd like you to create more slots for Title 20. And keep parents earning and children learning. My son is going to follow me with a few words. Good evening, everyone. My name is Christopher Joseph Harris, Jr., and this is my younger brother, Brandon. I want you to know that I'm a product, <clears throat> I'm a product of a strong early childhood education program. As a young child, I attended a great infant-slash-toddler and preschool program, as well as after-school care. My mother, being fully employed in the field, needed a place for me and my siblings. She knew the importance of a quality program. I am so grateful for the start I got in life because today I am a member of the National Honor Society and I am a well-adjusted junior high school student, a football player, and a basketball player. Player. When I see television shows and I hear about current events, so many times I see boys who look like me, but they don't have the same life. They are not standing before a group of decision makers like yourselves. Many of them may have sagging pants and gang tattoos. They may be school dropouts and involved in a life of crime, and the story goes on. I'd be willing to bet that many of my counterparts in this situation probably did not attend an early childhood program because statistics show that children who attend early childhood programs are less likely to be victims of such social ills. So my guess is that you won't ever have to vote on it, but this county will spend money on these youth. You will pay for youth detention programs. You will pay for drug treatment programs. You will pay for all kinds of intervention programs. You will pay for correctional facilities. At some point, you will pay. And you know what? You're going to pay a lot more than if you just vote now to help pay for early childhood education. Thank you for the space. Thank you. Jalen Montgomery. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Jalen Montgomery, and I am and I am on the behalf of the Safe Haven Summer Camp Program. Last summer was my first time attending the Safe Haven Program. I had so much fun. I learned a lot. We went on trips every week. We learned about STEM, which means science, technology, engineering, and math. I was able to learn how to build rockets, 
and make my own salad dressing from scratch. Thanks to the Girl Scouts. We did yoga and many other things. It was my first year, but it won't be my last. I was able to go because my mom said it was very affordable. I was looking forward to next summer. Please continue to support the Mount Vernon Youth Barrows programs. Thank you. <laughs> Joanna Straub. Good evening. My name is Joanna Straub. I'm the Executive Director of Nonprofit Westchester. When County Executive Astorino recently submitted his 2014 budget, he said that it was put together with the goals of protecting taxpayers, preserving essential services, and promoting economic growth. The three Ps, as the County Executive's philosophy goes, are admirable guideposts, and nonprofits throughout Westchester County commend him for succeeding in this very difficult task of balancing a budget without raising property taxes. Nonprofit Westchester, a coalition of more than 90 nonprofit organizations and growing, is ready to stand with the County Executive and the Board of Legislators in meeting some of the most pressing challenges of our time as you finalize a spending plan in the coming weeks for next year. <clears throat> We're here to help the County fulfill its obligations as our members have done for years. However, after several years of cuts, sequesters, and economic uncertainty, these vital organizations could use a little more help themselves. We're asking you to increase monies allocated to nonprofit partners in the county budget by 3%. It's a proven, prudent, and cost-effective investment with a modest and what we, be <clears throat> what we believe realistic request since the county executive projects a $13 million increase in state and federal aid and millions more in sales and mortgage tax receipts will truly ensure that the county's safety net and quality of life is not further diminished. Contrary to common belief, even maintaining level funding has a detrimental effect on service providers and their clients as they'll have to make significant cuts to offset the rising costs and greater demand for their services. Those operational demands are on top of other losses in recent years when funding was sliced by millions of dollars for a wide range of groups, including those that provide food to the hungry, legal help for women experiencing domestic violence, health care for the working poor, child care for parents who work, and services like the arts and parks that enhance quality of life but cannot keep up with ever-rising expenses. Nonprofit Westchester was formed in 2012 to strengthen the capacity, impact, and visibility of a sector that includes roughly 6,000 organizations in Westchester, whose expertise varies from housing and health care to education and the economy to tourism and transportation. Our members understand all too well how to provide quality services at a savings to taxpayers. Like so many people, we've tightened our belts, particularly during this prolonged recession when demands for our services have soared. Nonprofits are vital to, non to Westchester's economy. We create economic growth and opportunity as this sector alone employs nearly 100,000 people in Westchester. When all spending is accounted for, nonprofits generate a $23.5 billion impact in this county. That's money that's spent on food, housing, clothing, and basic necessities, and those dollars go right back into local communities and support local businesses. With results like this, it's no wonder that nonprofits are critically important to maintaining a wonderful quality of life and commitment to serving neighbors in need. We support the county executive's goals of protecting taxpayers, preserving essential services, and promoting economic growth. In fact, our members have shown that they are outstandingly successful in delivering on those promises. We're not only service providers, but taxpayers and concerned residents, and we care about Westchester County. Thank you for your time. Thank you. <laughs> Danita Blount, and as Danita's coming up, could we have Betsy Ann? Jose Dolores Cruz, Anne Frey, Natasha Led Ledger, and Ann Janiak. Danita. Good evening, everyone. My name is Danita Blount, and I am a licensed family group daycare provider. So much of hearing that there's a strong need for proper child care for our children. And not only am I a provider, I'm a mother, a concerned mother. So many times I see my parents coming in struggling, trying to make their way, trying to pay their co-pays. The co-pays have just gone so high for them. I've had families leave and my biggest fear is are the older children watching the younger children because they just cannot afford 
to send them to daycare, work, and take care of their own personal needs, such as food, shelter, transportation, getting their own children to school. It's not sad to see, it's painful to see when the children are taken out of good child care and they don't have the social skills that they need when they enter into school. Many of the children that do stay at my facility, I see when they go to school they progress and those that leave, I see they regress. And that's a sad thing. Because as the young man said, if we don't take care of them now, we will end up taking care of them later. So I'm encouraging you to please lower the copay back to 20% and restore Title 20. This year alone, I've lost five parents because Title 20 is no longer available. So that means five families without care. That means possibly five pam families who had to lose employment, who had to lose some type of way of living because they just could not afford a safe place to send their child. So I thank you for your cooperation, and I do strongly encourage you to consider the children. Thank you. Thank you. Betsy Ann. Good evening. My name is Betsy Ann and I'm representing Safe Haven After School Program. I've been working with Safe Haven for about three years now and I enjoy the people I work with and it's a great environment and experience. Safe Haven After School Program and Summer Program have increased basic skills provided in a safe place for youth ages from 7 to 13. This year alone, the progress served 306 students. That's all I got. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Jose Dolores? Cruz? No? Ann Frey? Good evening. Uh, I'm Ann Frey. I am the Director of Volunteers at the Wartburg, and I am a member of the Mount Vernon Youth Bureau. Um, I think you've already heard from some of the members of Mount Vernon Safe Haven, and they've spoken eloquently how we need to continue with the after-school program. We also, um, the Step Up program and the GEM program, which is Girls Empowerment. Um, we have the Saturday STEM program, which is really important for our young people but I'm really here to speak about the youth employment. Um, that's how I got involved with the Youth Bureau. I have summer youth come and work at the Wartburg, and I was so impressed with the quality of young people that I decided that I had to reach out and help some more. And each year that I've been there, we've had fewer and fewer students. And it's such a shame, because I'm also involved in the interviewing of these young people. There are hundreds of people who come, and young people who come to be interviewed. And I wish that we could take them all. It is so hard to whittle down that number because they have all such potential. Um, and one of, the, one of the key development milestones for teenagers is beginning experience in the workforce. Work experience not only helps teens explore future career options and earn much needed funds, but it is also cr builds crucial skills such as organizational time management and cooperation. I see that all the time with the young people, how they interact with our seniors, how they are with the staff. It's truly a building experience for them all. I also want to give a plug for the Youth Shelter of Westchester, which will be coming up soon to speak. Uh, they too do community service at our site every day. So the young people have an awful lot to offer us and we have to give back to them. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Natasha Ledger. And while Natasha's coming up, we've been joined by legislator David Gelfar. Oh. Oh, hey. And legislator Alfreda Williams. Hello, everyone, and good evening. My name is Natasha Ledger, and I am a very humble parent who is asking you to please continue investing in Safe Haven. Safe Haven is a place where my son loves going and makes sure that he's there every day. I have to tell you about what I've noticed. I've seen him grow into be a strong young man, a respectful young man. I've also seen him improve in his academic and social skills, but most importantly, his communicating. He's now able to communicate when he's having a problem. <laughs> 
as opposed to lashing out and trying to resolve that problem in a very different way. His respect level has improved. He has become an adorable child. And I am, as a parent, so grateful to know that he is well taken care of while I'm still at work. The people there are so nice and so honest with me with feedback, with helping me help him with his homework. So again, thank you for investing in the past, and please continue to do so. Thank you. <laughs> Ann Janiak, and while Ann is coming up, could we have Damian Graham, Tyrick Harris, Justin Ayala, and Brittany Henderson, and if Jose Dolores Cruz is here, please come up as well. Okay, Thank good you, evening. Anne. I'm Ann Janiak, and I'm the Executive Director of the Women's Enterprise Development Center, and I'm here tonight representing the Westchester Women's Agenda. We thank you for holding this public hearing, and we thank each of you for the time and attention that you have directed to our core and interrelated issues during the past few years, economic development, housing and homeless prevention, violence against women, health and mental health, children's services, legal services, civil legal services, and immigrant services. The administration and the board have challenged us to document our needs, to justify our costs, to find efficiencies, and to collaborate further, and we have done so. We are pleased to be here tonight with a much shorter list of requests to restore than in prior years, and we thank the administration and the board for working toward a 2014 budget that is fiscally responsible and provides for safety net services. We're also pleased that many of our issue areas are budgeted with a 3% increase, the first in many years. However, there are certain unfunded or underfunded safety net services to which we direct your attention and ask that you work with the administration to approve a budget that addresses them. In the housing area, we ask you that you provide funding for eviction prevention so that individuals and families can remain in their homes and that the county can avoid the cost of homelessness. Also in the housing area, we ask you to restore funding for technical assistance to develop affordable housing uh, to its 2012 level. A small investment in technical services generates hundreds of housing units for low and moderate income individuals. In children's services, we ask you to support this critically important issue. Research has shown that lack of high quality early childhood learning opportunities raises future costs to taxpayers of remedial, remedial education, school failure, and lower economic productivity. The decrease in funding for these services and the increase in the parent share of child care costs have excluded children from these services and have affected the quality and availability of childcare. Also, we're asking to please, have you please restore Invest in Kids to its total 2012 funding level of approximately 2.1 million and reconstitute it into a single budget line to be administered by the Youth Bureau through a competitive RFP. And finally, healthcare. Our community health centers are important cost-effective health delivery systems for those in greatest need. Their locations are dispersed throughout the county and their hours are responsive to the needs of individual patients. These core safety net services not only address the needs of individuals and families, they contribute to and protect the quality of life in the county and save cost over the long term. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Damian Graham. And Tyrek Harris, am I right? Hi, my name is Tyrek Harris from the New Shelter Program at Webster County of Turner for Prisons. I think you should continue to fund the New Shelter because it gives you a different view of life. The New Shelter Program gives a lot of social skills and discipline, also a lot of programs we attend during the day. During my stay at the New Shelter, I graduated, and now I'm thinking of going to college. And if it wasn't for the New Shelter, none of this would be possible. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. My name is Damian Graham. I'm also from the Youth Shelter Program in Westchester. And out of, out of many opportunities, I could say truthfully that I missed out on, the Youth Shelter has been a great opportunity to give me a, 
a peace of mind. I'm not going into college, I'm only in 11th grade, but I'm actually going for a high school diploma now. And if I wasn't in a youth shelter, thank you. If I wasn't in a youth shelter, it would just be, I would just be living regretful and everything, you know. But if you will fund a youth shelter, I would appreciate, we'll continue funding the youth shelter, I would appreciate it, because I want this program to live long after I'm, I'm gone, and hopefully help kids just like me that was in need of a, a second chance. Thank you. Appreciate it. First, thank you for the opportunity to speak my situation. I'm here actually, um, not fully prepared, but just to speak and to uh, piggyback on some of the uh, speakers previously, um, Ms. Kathy Hallis, as far as uh, restoring funding for the Title 20 child care programs. Um, I am a mother of, of a two-year-old, and uh, before, um, you know, I didn't really plan. Um, I didn't know what I was going to do as far as child care. Um, so a relative was taking care of them, and I was able to find uh, child care in my neighborhood, and it is very expensive. Um, I mean, I've made several sacrifices. Do I pay the light bill or pay for child care? Do I pay for my cell phone bill or pay for child care? And in the event um, when there are things you can't plan for, such as a, a, a car repair, you know, you, you need to be safe in your car, but you also have that ob that obligation to pay the child care. Um, the, the fee is definitely very expensive, but the child care program that he's in, Little Blessings of Nourishell, um, he, um, I I've noticed a dramatic change in him from when he was with my relative to him being in the program, and that's my motivation alone to continue to just do what I have to do to pay. Um, however, it is a struggle. Um, it is a struggle to um, try to, to, to pay what I need to pay and send my child to somewhere safe, you know, not just somewhere that he's being watched as opposed to being taken care of. Um, I don't I, I just I have a serious passion to just make sure my, my son can maybe stand up here one day and, and to speak like some of the young men that spoke before me. Um, and um, just, Again, you know, just consider it like the, the young lady said before. Just think about the children because that's where it starts. Even at this young age of 2 to 10 to however old, 17, 18, it starts at this age. And to um, just put him in a program that's not really, or not even a program, but just to have him somewhere just for the time being whilst, you know, and not really being uh, taught, so to speak. Um, I feel like it, it, it's it's... It's definitely important um, to try to um, increase those program, uh, the uh, Title 20 openings, if possible. Um, thank you for your time. Thank you. Is there anyone who has not had an opportunity to fill out a card, or anyone who would like to come up and who did not fill out a card? And we're still looking for Jose Dolores and Justin Ayala, neither of whom are here. Anybody who didn't fill out a card but would like to come up and speak? All right. Thank you all for coming out on this Thank awful you. evening. Uh, we appreciate it. We, in, we very much appreciate hearing from you as we go through this process. And you are really very, very valuable to us as, as we move forward. So thank you for taking the time out and coming up and speaking with us. Have a good thank night. You. Get home safely. Hey folks, if we could all pass our knees down, I'll sally a little bit.